Hi, I'm, I'm Elizabeth Rosenthal. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News and uh, wrote a book called An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. Um, I trained as an MD, and before that, I was with the New York Times for 22 years. So we're talking about new dimensions in value. I've been hearing um, about new dimensions in value for about 30 years. So um, I'm hoping we can talk about the new new dimensions because I think we are kind of at a crisis point with uh, costs and value in this country or past it. So. I'm not going to introduce people. Um, we'll have a great discussion afterwards. They're going to come up and introduce themselves. And here we go in the order uh, that's on your program. Great. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Dan Polsky, um, professor at Johns Hopkins University. And it's really a delight to be here. Um, so new dimensions in value, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, let's see, uh, volume to value and the invisible gorilla. So the basic uh, concept here, I don't know how many people are familiar with the famous video of the invisible gorilla. So I'm not going to show you that video. I'm going to spoil it for you. Um, so basically, there's this video where you have to watch, they instruct you to watch and say there's, there's three people in white shirts and three people in black shirts, and you have to count the number of passes uh, among the people in white shirts. You watch this video, and then at the end, they ask you, did you see the gorilla? And so how many people think that if a gorilla walks through the screen on this video, for nine seconds and thumps his chest in the middle of the video and then walks off, would you see the gorilla? So it turns out if you're focused on counting the number of passes, half the people don't see the gorilla. I didn't see the gorilla. I didn't see it. And if you haven't done the video, I've spoiled it for you. You're going to be looking for the gorilla. Um, but it's good fun to watch anyway. Um, but the point here is that uh, once you have a solution in mind, I'm going to solve this problem, I'm going to count those, those balls, I wanted to ace this test, that uh, you can miss alternative solutions. So the point of my uh, brief remarks is not so much to, I'm not the one that's going to say I have all the new dimensions for value, um, but just to point out that uh, the focus on transformation of payment and delivery from volume to value may keep us from seeing the gorillas that are driving healthcare spending. And I'm just going to go through some examples here. Uh, the three examples I'm going to talk about are payment reform. Um, and uh, Michael covered it really well in the last talk, so I might breeze through that a little bit. We have a lot of speakers here. Uh, so the basic point here is the move towards value and away from volume is slowly transforming delivery. But how has it changed uh, uh, healthcare spending? The second one I'm going to talk about is consumer-directed health plans. Um, they do engage consumers, uh, but are the choices they're making uh, ones that are, are value-based or, or just reducing uh, consumption? And value-based pricing, uh, particularly in drugs, uh, I think of that as a misnomer. Uh, more, m maybe a better term is quality-based pricing. And Michael touched on that a little bit too, but I'm going to talk about that for a second. But the, the point here is that maybe this is classic misdirection. A value-based uh, healthcare delivery system may be a better system, but it is a false solution uh, if, if our goal is to address health spending growth. Uh, first, payment reform. So there's been a huge increase, a lot, as people in this room know, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. From almost nothing to more than 50% of contracts have some type of uh, value-based uh, uh, mechanism in them. Uh, so that's up from almost nothing in the past 10 years. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, 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 ways of doing that, uh, rewarding processes of care, achieving a certain amount of outcomes for their patients, providing superior patient experience, um, and financial accountability. Um, Michael went through these, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the evidence. Uh, they've been covered really well. The basic bottom line is the things we've tried and we've looked at the evidence, meh, you know, has it really made a difference in healthcare spending? You know, we could find the dollars somewhere, but I'm gonna just point out one is that a lot of the value, uh, a lot of the reductions in spending that we've seen in the ACO program have been through one-sided risk. 
So providers have a lot of say here in these programs. So they, they opt in when it's one-sided risk. They don't like two-sided risk, right? They don't want to lose. They only want to gain. So what that means is those that, um, that are uh, spending more and going over the, the baseline don't get penalized. So if you include those in, in, in the total calculation, Medicare really isn't saving uh, a lot of money here. So um, the, I, that the point I want to make uh, on that one-sided risk is just the degree to which providers have a lot of control in uh, kind of dictating this volume-to-value -value, uh, payment system. Um, and and I and so the gorilla here, uh, as I think has already been pointed out and probably be pointed out again, are prices. So if we are moving risk to the providers, to manage risk, you want to be bigger. It's a smart move. If a provider, as providers become bigger, they gain more uh, market power and can negotiate higher prices. So there's trade-offs here, and we have to keep that in mind as we push from volume to value. We have larger providers that can demand higher prices, and, and so we have to think about that when we think about solutions going forward. Um, next, uh, consumer-directed health plans. M most of you in this room probably know this uh, really excellent paper um, called What Does a Deductible Do? Uh, the Impact of Cost Sharing on Healthcare Prices, uh, Quantities, and Spending Dynamics. And the basic, uh, the bottom line here is uh, when a company introduced high deductible health plans, there was about a 12% reduction in spending, but they saw no, you know, as consumers, uh, they weren't able to detect what was a, a, a high value reduction or a low value reduction. They just reduced all spending. So uh, it, this idea that, uh, and, and they also found no evidence that consumers were really figuring out how to shop. Right, so as we move towards engaging consumers to think about value, I think the, the, the evidence suggests that uh, these incentives that we put on consumers to engage uh, don't really uh, uh, connect to value, but may just connect to, to chopping um, spending overall and uh, uh, chopping utilization overall. So how do, how do they shop? So if you go to, uh, I went to Yelp. I just grabbed, it was the first thing I grabbed from Yelp. You know, in terms of how, if you go to Yelp to shop for hospitals, every comment is about the parking and the Wi-Fi. All right, so if you want to have a consumer-directed hospital experience, have great parking, excellent Wi-Fi, and don't put the air conditioning too high, which is what this person really complained about. So it's, is that, is that you know, as we think about all our quality metrics, uh, for, for hospitals, we don't put Wi-Fi in there, right? We, we think we want to reduce hospitalizations, and, and that, that's just not what's really compelling to the consumers. Um, the other point about uh, prices, so, you know, I was shopping for a TV, and I know how many inches I want, I know, you know, and it's still, I, it, it, how do we shop, you know, based on prices? We put in our, you know, is this how we're going to be shopping? Uh, like we shop for TVs uh, on Google, you know, there are some really amazing uh, websites out there to do some shoppable care, like for MRIs. But, you know, what size MRI? You know, how do we, you know, bring quality in there when it comes to MRIs? I think about it more like I shop for wine. So I never want to get the cheapest wine. I just pick, like, the next cheapest one. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. If there is quality in the $100 one, it's completely lost on me. Like, is that how we're going to be shopping for care? So I just wanted to make that. So the third uh, is value-based pricing, which has become uh, quite uh, uh, a discussion point, particularly for drugs. <clears throat> so this is an umbrella term. So manufacturers link prices, link the price of charges from a jug to an assessment of how well it works. There could be other value-based pricing where, OK, if it didn't work for you in 90 days, you, know, you, won't, you don't have to pay for it. Right? Or, or it's by indication. If it works better for this indication than that indication, you pay more for the indication where it works better. That's this idea of value-based pricing. I think of that more as uh, quality-based pricing. Um, because the, the, the challenge here, particularly when it comes to drugs that are life-saving, is that, it, that we don't really think about the budget constraint. Right? We, we can set a price based on how much uh, your life is valued at. And then, 
everybody wants anyone whose life can be saved to get that drug. But if the price is determined externally, those advocating that everyone should get the drug don't really care what the price is. Like, how do we get that person that drug? But if the price is, is based on the entire value of a life, where does the budget constraint come in? How can we talk about the budget constraint here? And it's a really difficult thing, particularly when, when it's about lives. And so where do we see the most value-based pricing? The manufacturers are, are arguing for value-based pricing when it's about lives being saved, lives being saved. That's a really hard thing to price. And I don't have the solution, hopefully Rena does, um, but I just am pointing it out as a, as a gorilla in the room. Um, so this is how I think about value-based pricing. Uh, so, you know, the day-old bread? I love that when I was like a college student, like that was a good deal. I wanted the day-old bread. If I go to the store now and bring home the day-old bread, my wife is going to send me back to the store. <laughs> you know, my budget constraints are a little bit different than when I was a kid, so it would be a very low-value purchase uh, in my, you know, professor's salary, but it would have been an excellent value purchase in my student's salary. Another high-value purchase was uh, this uh, individual who brought, bought this uh, 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO, $48 million dollars he probably went home and his wife was thrilled, right? That was a great value purchase for that individual. Probably the happiest person, you know, on his block, or probably the only person on his block or his <laughs> island. Um, but, you know, based on his budget constraint, that was probably a high value purchase. Um, but if we set the price of our fancy new drug at the $48 million, because that's what the value is for a particular individual, and then, uh, people are going to say, well, everyone should get that drug. We're going to run out of money. Um, so that's, uh, that's my third gorilla in the room. So I'm just going to uh, finish with just beware of the false solution. Um, providers and suppliers are setting the volume to value agenda. One-sided risk and consolidation. Parking and Wi-Fi. Pricing for quality when life is on the line. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you, Altaram, for putting together this outstanding panel and the one before it. Um, I am sleepless. <laughs> I do not have slides. We are in the middle, um, I think, of um, real reform that's going to happen on drug pricing. And so I'm sleepless and have notes because of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, I actually think that we're about to make real progress. And we're on the cusp of some really interesting um, new solutions to, um, to pricing um, new drugs in the US. So I'm an expert on pricing of um, drugs. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the supply of these products, I think a lot about the demand for these products, and finally, what sets the price. Um, my goal for my remarks are really to um, uh, give you the lay of the land. This market is actually quite complex. The complexity serves its masters. It's intentional. It's very easy to get lost in the weeds. It's very easy for policymakers and other folks to get focused on stuff that isn't actually that, um, isn't going to actually move the needle in either helping people gain better access or increase affordability in this market as well. My goal is to get you thinking about the objectives of current federal policy and, again, to get you actually excited about where we are and where we may be going um, in uh, policy reform. The other thing that I want to um, emphasize for you is that um, there are no silver bullets here. You, and you cannot alter incentives for affordability without addressing incentives for innovation and vice versa. So in some sense, the general argument for policy reform should be, should be really based on the healthcare quadrilemma that incentives for sustained innovation and improved equitable access to drugs that truly transform people's lives ha are a piece and they have to move together. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention to you is that all of the debate 
is largely about the prices and um, access to new drugs. 90% of all drugs consumed in the United States are generic or biosimilar. We paid the lowest prices in the OECD for those countries, for those, for those drugs. We shouldn't uh, want uh, to alter those incentives. Instead, what we're really focusing on are specialty drugs. Those are infused, injected, or otherwise delivered, um, and, um, and new, new products. So um, let me set, set the stage for you for why we need reform. We live in an incredible era of new scientific discovery. Um, we are making significant progress on genetics, proteomics, et cetera. The labor costs of making this type of product progress are non-trivial, and we invest significant public funds in having a labor force that can produce the best science in the world attached to this type of innovation. In other words, the vast majority of the labor costs and all of the upfront costs for manufacturing these products or coming up with the ideas to manufacture these products are fundamentally borne by the American taxpayer, by you and me. The other part of drug development is done by the private sector. The economics of drug discovery is long, it's prone to failure, it's very expensive. Most new drugs originate in biotech. They really do need to pay their investors back. Does that mean that the cost of R&D should be fundamentally linked to how much the prices of these products um, are charged ultimately when they come to fruition? Nope. Um, the, the only thing that the prices are related to is maximizing revenue for that company that's, that's now going to bring it to market. Once treatments are available, we should use them to improve people's health. The prices, however, of these products are exceptionally large now. The average cancer drug is launching at prices that are five times that of the median American's household income. Um, you don't need a PhD to figure out that when the price of a drug is more than the cost of a kid's college education at a fancy private school, you have a problem. Um, so we spend about 20% give or take of healthcare dollars on drugs now. What's the right level of spending? People ask me this all the time related to drugs, relative to other stuff in the healthcare system. Well, it likely varies quite a lot by productivity and it both in terms of its input but also its output. It also likely varies by disease state and the state of embodied science. There are some therapeutic areas where we used to do all sorts of stuff that, that, that had involved physicians and diagnostic tests, et cetera, where now would people just pop a pill and move on with productive lives. Um, in some sense, we should see more of that. Um, and that's actually the promise of new technology. This view that really we should be investing dollars in healthcare um, that seeks the most productive use, but also the most health out of that use of those dollars can actually fundamentally conflict with physician and hospital culture and also market power that, other, that both pharmaceutical companies but also these other um, entities hold. Um, I'm gonna come back to this and I expect actually most of the panelists are gonna come back to this. Now, spending is comprised of um, use and price. Um, again, I don't think we really actually have a use, utilization problem here. There is some overuse of these products, but I would argue actually some, most of it is underuse. Um, really what we have is a pricing problem. So we need to learn a little bit more about why the prices are so high. This is a very tightly regulated industry, and fundamentally, one should consider federal regulation as actually setting the rules of the road for both what gets developed, but also what ultimately is allowed to be charged for these products. So what's the role of federal government in this market? And how does this interact with the prices? First, we have patents to ensure temporary monopoly that coaxes innovators to innovate against all odds, and investors to invest in innovation. That sits on other private incentives to innovate, which include fame and glory, <laughs> um, 
Patterns are really important here, and they're much different than in other areas of tech, and they're complemented by other intellectual property concerns, most notably trade secrets, and I would argue, actually, that the vast majority of the new products that are coming on the market, they're a combination of caring about patents and other types of monopoly, um, uh, but also trade secrets. Um, the NIH, NIH drives basic research, U.S. Treasury policy also creates incentives for innovators to innovate, investors to invest, but also for us to use more of these services. The FDA oversees other types of monopoly and exclusivity, but also ensures the safety and efficacy of these new products as they come in. And then there are various HHS programs to ensure access and affordability once these products are launched, and an alphabet soup of discounts, rebates, et cetera, to make sure that the most vulnerable patients in this setting, or the ones who have the least willingness to pay, are actually the ones who are trying to gain access. And that includes Medicaid, Medicaid best prices, 340B, um, and then all of the insurance programs that are sitting on top of that. The fact that there's so much federal control is actually a good thing. That means that the Congress, which oversees all of these different agency activities, has the power to change the rules of the road. This includes both incentives to innovate, but also incentives to uh, increase the affordability of these products as they come available. What are the challenges? I believe there are two. The first is affordability, and the second is greed. Affordability. <laughs> The prices of these products is fundamentally determined by insurance and the drug companies. Many people in the US, whether they're seniors or employed individuals who are insured under, employ under um, uh, their employer's insurance, are underinsured for these drugs. They actually face first dollar uh, requirements for actually gaining access to these therapies. That's true for the new products, but it's also true for the old products. Um, and then there's greed. Um, pharma, of course. This is, after all, an industry operating within a capitalist system. It has shareholders to uh, respond to and uh, quarterly profit um, marks to meet. But the industry is not a monolith. There are truly innovative companies who truly care about affordability of their products moving forward. And those companies coexist with those that take advantage of permissive pricing to charge crazy high prices for stuff that isn't valuable, it doesn't work, um, or for stall branded and generic competition indefinitely. I think less commonly appreciated and one that I think um, Dr. Rosenthal and many others here have written about um, very uh, compellingly is that there is also a diversity of other participants that profit off of this system, which include physicians and hospitals, but also PBMs and GPOs. How do these institutions make money off this system? They buy low and they sell high. They generate revenue that goes to fund other things. What do we do? Um, we are in the process of trying to change the rules of the road. Um, the first piece of the policies that are coming down the pike here are all about competition. Why? Well, competition is the great anecdote or anecdote to greed whether it be pharmaceutical company greed or these other members of the institutions that, um, uh, that also uh, have unholy alliances with the, with the pharmaceutical industry to keep prices high um, and make money off of them. Um, there are other types of greed. Um, we've heard a lot about rebate reform. I don't know if that's gonna, actually gonna move forward. But um, the one thing that is part and parcel of dealing with greed is having a big stick to wave at these industries that are um, pricing with impunity. Um, one way of getting prices back in line is simply to set administrative prices and global budgets. We can look to Europe um, for good examples of that. That's what the, whether that's what the administration's IPI program is trying to do. We can look in our own backyards. 
There are states, New York, Maryland, Massachusetts, that are already pursuing global budgets uh, and already setting pricing boards um, for thinking about value for these new products. Um, we already have independent, not-for-profit, health economics expertise that can help adjudicate value and identify fair pro prices for these products. ICER is one example. There are others. If anything, these type of institutions can be strengthened and relied upon, and perhaps I think it's best for them to stay independent as well. Um, we also need to get out of the business of paying piecemeal for drugs that truly transform people's lives and instead move towards quantity guarantees in exchange for lower prices. Um, some of you may be aware of what the state of Louisiana is doing on the hepatitis C drugs. I, I'm part of that policy team, but um, the state of Louisiana just announced that they deal with Gilead to bulk purchase hepatitis C drugs in exchange um, for unlimited access. Um, they are going to embark upon an elimination strategy that is going to help provide access to these products for both the Medicaid population but also the state prison population. That is transformative um, and is likely a model for thinking through other ways of purchasing these products, um, particularly ones that actually provide <coughs> cures uh, moving forward. And then finally, we're going to see a lot of discussion and movement on increasing access and affordability to patients needing treatment. Um, we need to strive to reduce disparities in access to treatment that truly inform people's lives. Um, but we also should also, and I think part of that is going to be, uh, part of the narrative is going to be that we should all share in the fruits of the science that we paid for. Here's my closing thought. <clears throat> we shouldn't seek to bankrupt truly innovative companies, largely based, on, based in the US, that produce so much health, good paying jobs, and wealth for us all. We should seek a new social contract with this industry, entailing reasonable prices and quantities that ensure access to the existing fruits that don't bankrupt individual patients, their families, or payers, including us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, uh, Paul and Altaram. I'm very grateful. Um, my disclaimer is that, like the slide says, I'm the former, as of July 1st, I'm the former Chief Clinical Officer of Ascension Healthcare. Uh, but I will talk, I'm very proud of my association with Ascension, and I will talk about the Ascension story, advancing healthcare equity, and how um, the, you're challenged as a provider organization uh, when you are truly trying to advance healthcare equity and reduce overall spending. I will use some slides. Had I known that it was possible not to use some, um, I, I may have. I also had a tie this morning, but then I had breakfast with Len Nichols, and I thought, you know, I don't need one, so I took it off. So um, the... Um, um, uh, the story of Ascension, it's a religious organization founded by um, um, religious women, uh, truly committed to, to helping the poor. And um, the, the translation of Ascension's commitment to help the poor is actually, in, uh, translates in a, a genuine desire and passionate desire to eliminate healthcare disparity, i.e., advance healthcare um, equity. There's also a, a, a genuine commitment to advance uh, care for population and, and um, advance the um, healthcare safety uh, as well as uh, decreasing healthcare costs. So, so this strategic commitment is translated into a series of goals. That was a big part of what I did, which is translate the strategic commitment into annual goals that we tie executive compensation to, that, that we hold people accountable to across all 150 hospitals, uh, across all um, uh, associates and, and, and physicians. Um, and it's a big deal, so to speak, because size of the organization, we end up 
Um, if you, uh, there are various ways to estimate it, and, and uh, we care for about 2 to 3% of United States. Um, another way to estimate it is that we care for enough uh, for as many people as the country of Denmark. So people talked about Denmark earlier. So our annual goals uh, become uh, somewhere between the world of policy and, and the world of actual management and actual um, uh, the day-to-day -day execution and, and running an organization. So we have a series of goals uh, that we established in 2016 that relate to advancing healthcare equity. And that specifically means that we're going to target improvement of chronic illness management in, uh, across vulnerable populations. And we're going to target cancer care, starting with cancer screening, across vulnerable populations. In the beginning, the data sources were not good enough for race and ethnicity, uh, so we used Medicaid beneficiary, being Medicaid beneficiary as a surrogate uh, for uh, vulnerable status, but then we kept refining our data systems, and we have a series of goals related to improving diabetes in African-American uh, populations, um, and so on and so forth. So, the goals were chosen, again, through a lot of, there was a lot of work that, that went into these, and uh, um, um, this is beyond the scope of this conversation, but the idea is that we will improve care for all with, as, a, as a target, as a, as a threshold, and then as a target, um, there is a specific goal to go over and above the overall improvement focusing on the vulnerable population. Um, there's no, um, um, if you go to the, as somebody mentioned, Michael Cherno earlier talked about NQF. If you go to NQF and say, give me the measures for, that I could use to advance healthcare equity, you, you won't get them. Um, so we had to develop all that. And, uh, and then I went around the country and compared notes with my colleagues in, in Kaiser Permanente and uh, Mayo, and, and our methodologies were actually very consistent. So a specific focus on the vulnerable population, even if the improvement is significant in the general population, uh, but we're comparing where the vulnerable population is today compared to the baseline when we started. So in other words, uh, you, you don't improve equity by deteriorating care of the general population so that the delta goes down. You have to improve the care for all with a specific focus on the vulnerable, and if the care for all end up in, in significant improvement in the general population, that's okay too. Um, starting with, with um, uh, heart failure, um, our results actually exceeded our expectations. So what was thought to be a valiant effort and the right thing to do ended up costing uh, thousands <laughs> of hospitalizations that did not happen. Um, and, and we didn't back off. So, so, so started with you know, 2018, 2019, the goals were related to colonoscopy screening and heart failure um, um, improvement measured by eliminating preventable hospitalizations, right? We didn't back off. We're, we have similar goals on asthma COPD going forward. And, and you would argue that this is, a, this is good. This is a good thing. It's a good thing for those who, whose health was improved. It's a good thing for an organization that, that's trying to, um, that's, that's genuinely trying to become a provider of care for populations rather than a fee-for-service hospital-centered provider. You would argue that this would allow us to actually start making arrangements related to um, fee for value and changing our revenue model. Um, so the first, uh, the first discovery is that payers are not interested in the ability to improve care for one condition, uh, which I totally understand. If I was on the payer side, I would do exactly the same. 
Um, I started um, uh, comparing notes with, with other uh, colleagues around the country, both on the delivery side, but also on the health plan side. And so I reached out to uh, leaders of, of health plans and said, so help me do it. Help me, help me change my revenue model. Um, I'm, I'm willing, we're willing to advance risk and we're willing to risk taking and we're willing to change our revenue model from fee for service to, to taking more and more risk. Help us learn how to do it. It's a very sad discovery because I've been told by many people around the country, look, um, we have this um, situation in this particular state, we have this other situation in this other state, and the bottom line is if you succeed, in hitting all your goals related to population health, you end up losing revenue than if you continue doing business as usual and have um, um, uh, be paid uh, fee for service. So it's, it was disappointing, uh, but, but then when you think about it, it's not a zero sum game. <laughs> It is a matter of simple math. I, I think all the panelists uh, before us and, and now everybody has been repeating the same statement that it is about simple math and the numbers just are not adding up. If you watch HBO, uh, anybody watches Veep? Yeah. There's this ridiculous character that is accusing algebra of being uh, Sharia math, and he wants to eliminate Muslim math and replace it with American math. Um, I don't think we can do that. <laughs> I think we have to accept algebra the way, the way we've inherited, the way, the way it should be taught, and, and we have to accept the fact that in an industry where supply drives demand, we cannot reduce cost without somehow rethinking supply. And I'm not saying the country should shut down hospitals. I'm not, I don't know how we reduce supply, but, but at least we can, we can meddle with the relation between supply and demand because um, uh, we're seeing the numbers continue to grow. We're seeing supply continue to grow. And, and everybody keeps believing that in this uh, uh, industry, supply will continue driving demand. So what happens when organizations actually, so you could argue, all right, well, with eroding margins, with eroding hospitalizations, uh, there will be losers. And that's okay. Market capitalism will regulate the, the supply because the losers will actually um, have to shut down. So look around the country and look at organizations or hospitals, what happens when a hospital decides to shut its doors. All of a sudden, every, all the forces that are against the spending in healthcare, uh, that are for rationalization, et cetera, et cetera, all of a sudden, the language changes and you're taking jobs away from, from the local economy. You are, um, uh, it's a very difficult position to be in, having been in this position in a couple of states. But it's not just about us. It happens in all organizations around the country. Uh, Michael Dowling has a famous saying that uh, everybody is, is down on hospitals until you try to join them and shut one of your hospitals down. Then everybody is, is up in arms against you. Um, I do not know, I mean, um, uh, we were just hearing about how consumer choices are, are very difficult to, to, to be trusted um, in, 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 in regulating uh, health care. Um, I, I do not know if, um, um, if market capitalism works on its own uh, regulating um, health care. I do not have, I'm not a policy guy, I'm a physician with an MBA. Um, I, I do not know how to create the regulatory climate so that uh, market capitalism will work better. Uh, but so far, um, in my mind, it seems a very simple equation that we have too much supply uh, for what we're getting. This is it. Thank you very much.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chapin White. Uh, I'm a healthcare economist, and I'd like to thank you all for Alterum for inviting me to uh, speak to you all. And um, uh, I think there's there's some really interesting uh, synergies across the uh, across the talks today. And um, uh, first, I want to say that the the first panel, uh, Mike Chernu and uh, uh, Mark Goldwyn, uh, focused on Medicare and uh, the spending trajectory. The uh, uh, deficit and debt trajectory, uh, that might get you all worried about uh, spending in the Medicare pro I am not worried about Medicare. Med Medicare has got it under control, okay? Um, the Medicare Part A Trust Fund is projected to go uh, insolvent. Well, I have news for you. The Medicare uh, spending trajectory uh, in Part A in particular is very well controlled. There is the, the trustees have got their eye on the ball. Uh, CBO's got their eye on the ball. MedPAC is all over this. There's a, there's a uh, forum, uh, the US Congress, we happen to be right here, for uh, addressing the issues, either by raising taxes or cutting spending. OK, Medicare, uh, I'm honestly not that worried about, even after hearing Mark's kind of chilling comments. Um, I'm going to focus instead on uh, the privately insured, uh, uh, private health plans. This is the area where I, my take is we should be concerned. Um, it's much harder to get a handle on what's going on uh, among the privately insured and spending on the privately insured. We, d we don't have a you know, private PAC. You know, there's no private health plan payment advisory commission to keep their eye on it. Um, and uh, there is a fortress of secrecy around a lot of the uh, financial transactions uh, among the privately insured. It, it's the polar opposite of what goes on in Medicare where uh, we've got incredible information systems uh, and all the cards are on the table. Okay, so let me uh, quickly sketch out uh, what I'm gonna do in this, in this talk. First, I'm gonna uh, summarize some research that we put out recently on uh, hospital pricing, uh, and then I'm gonna draw out the, the implications that I see for policymakers and for, uh, and for you all. Um, so the, the study that, uh, that I'm describing, we, we put out uh, in May, um, and I, I call it the Rand Hospital Price Transparency Study. It has some very long uh, title. The, the web link is at the bottom if you want to uh, download it. I encourage you all to, to do that. Um, we looked at the uh, prices paid to hospitals by private health plans. We used all-payer claims databases. Self-insured employers contributed their, their claims data. Uh, and we measured the, the negotiated allowed amounts that private plans were paying hospitals relative to what Medicare would have paid for the same services at the same facilities. And we call that a relative price, a percent of Medicare. Um, we included uh, around 1,600 hospitals in 25 states. The study was partly funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, they, RWJ was really instrumental to uh, getting this effort uh, off the ground. We're gearing up for another round of the study. We're recruiting uh, more employers, more APCDs, and we want to keep, keep growing this. So let me um, summarize what we found. Um, on average, private health plans in 2017 were paying 241% of what Medicare would have paid. Again, same facilities, uh, same services. We also found very wide variation across states, across uh, hospital systems, across service lines, especially inpatient versus outpatient, and uh, across hospitals, hospital to hospital. So here is um, uh, one of the fun charts from the, from the public report that we put out where we ranked states low to high on their, uh, their prices relative to Medicare for hospital services. Uh, Michigan uh, is down at the very bottom. I won't bother using the pointer. Michigan's down at the very bottom at around 150% of Medicare. Uh, Indiana is at the, uh, at the very top, uh, above 300% of Medicare uh, on average. Um, and let me, let me dig a little more. It's a little uncomfortable bringing, bringing up, uh, up this slide. There's a really interesting, uh, huge divergence between Michigan and Indiana in their private hospital prices. Hospitals in, in Indiana are getting, on average, about double uh, or more of what hospitals in Michigan are getting. Again, this, this is all relative, relative to Medicare. Um, and you, you can actually look, even within a, a large multi-hospital system, Within the same system, two states, Michigan and Indiana, they're, they're neighbors, they're adjoining, they're similar in a lot of ways. The, the hospitals within this one single system 
uh, that are located in Indiana are getting twice the price uh, of hospitals in Michigan within the same system. Now, what makes this a little uncomfortable uh, is that the system is actually Ascension Health, which is, uh, and this, this is a slide that is part of our like pre-packaged pre slide deck. I, I did not at all go out of my way to try to make this presentation more uncomfortable than it had to be, okay. Um, okay. The, the implication to me when it, we, Good. Um, um, the implication to me is um, if you think about uh, competitive markets, uh, uh, suppliers are going to be cutting their costs, uh, as, as operating as efficiently as possible. Their pricing is going to reflect the efficient cost of production. Uh, in the uh, hospital space, when it comes to private health plans, my big picture take <clears throat> is that um, the pricing does not reflect a functioning competitive market. Um, and that may seem like a provocative claim. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm glad I'm seeing some nodding here. Good. Um, from the right side. Um, <clears throat> um, that may seem uh, to be a provocative we'll statement. we talk more outside, though. What's that? We'll yeah. talk more outside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, having looked through these, uh, looked through the, the prices, the variation we see, um, uh, th this is not a case where you have suppliers uh, cutting costs uh, operating as efficiently as possible, and then and then prices being determined by those efficient production costs. There is something else going on here. Um, so what's uh, what's going on, uh, and what's what's contributing to the pricing patterns that we see uh, uh, in private health plans and their interactions with hospitals? So now we we finally get to the title of the slide: the glitch. What am I talking about uh, when I'm talking about the glitch? So um, uh, I think there there are three uh, components uh, to uh, a glitch in our healthcare financing system. Uh, and uh, the, the three legs are, uh, we, we've set up an arrangement where we have private health plans who are in bilateral negotiations with hospitals over prices and networks. So the hospitals can, can refuse to contract uh, with, a, with a plan uh, if they want to. That's uh, leg number one of uh, the glitch. Leg number two is hospitals have uh, total freedom to set their charges, their, their list price or their bill charges at whatever level they, they want. If a patient goes to a hospital that's not in their plan's network, either the patient or the plan is potentially on the hook for full bill charges. And I've, I've heard the quip that uh, bill charges are limited only by the CFO's imagination. And, these are fairly imaginative uh, people um, based on the, the charge, uh, charges that you see. Um, leg number three is widespread unshoppability. Um, and, and what produces unshoppability in, in hospital, uh, hospital care? I think there, there are three, I didn't want to do like a, a, a three-legged you know, stool of the third leg of the stool, but there, there are three ways you can get hospital services uh, being unshoppable. unshoppable. Number one is uh, natural monopolies. And what I'm thinking about there is um, neonatal intensive care units. Um, there is a minimum efficient scale. These have to be staffed um, 24 hours a day by highly specialized personnel. You cannot have a half a bassinet NICU uh, on every street corner. There's a minimum efficient scale. Once you get up to that minimum efficient scale, that hospital running that NICU will cover a large population area. That's a natural monopoly, okay? There are also uh, human-made monopolies. Human-made monopolies, I'm not, I'm being like intentionally non-sexist here. Human-made monopolies, uh, what I'm thinking here is the situation where, and this happens in some metro areas, all the OBGYNs join into a single practice and that practice is bought by a single hospital system. That's a human-made monopoly. There are the same you know, economies of scale issues with OBGYN services, but if the OBGYNs all uh, consolidate and become owned by a single hospital and you're having a baby, you're, you're stuck. That's a, that's a human-made monopoly. And then the third case is um, emergencies. Pretty much every hospital has an emergency department. Uh, people are going to come in uh, through the doors regardless of what um, what plan they have and whether their plan negotiated uh, a contract with that hospital. So natural monopolies, human-made monopolies, 
and emergencies all result in widespread unshoppability of large chunks of hospital care. So those are, those are the three stools of the, um, of the glitch. Uh, what, what it results when you have uh, these, these three elements in place. So we can start running through uh, experiments where, where we say, let's look at different types of health plans and different types of providers. Where do we see all three of these elements in place? Uh, let's look at uh, Medicare Advantage plans, um, and uh, let's look at primary care uh, physicians. Primary care physicians can negotiate, uh, there's bilateral negotiation with Medicare Advantage, um, but there is not uncapped uh, out-of-network liability in Medicare Advantage. Uh, Bob Berenson and colleagues has, has written uh, really stellar pieces outlining the special case of Medicare Advantage where out-of-network Payments are limited at by the Medicare fee-for-service rate. Okay, so we don't have like two uh, unshoppability. Um, for primary care physicians, there are a lot of primary care physicians. Um, I'd say the unshoppability is less or, or little of a concern with, with primary care physicians. Um, with Medicare Advantage uh, and hospitals, you have two of the legs, but you don't have the uncapped out-of-network um, uh, feature. You don't have the, the three-legged glitch stool. Um, that's a terrible phrase, but uh, I, I should have tried it out more at, uh, out loud before I, I gave this talk. Um, let's look at private employer-sponsored plans uh, with primary care physicians. They're negotiated. There's potentially an uncapped out-of-network, but but there's the unshoppability isn't really an issue. Where you see uh, this glitch pop out is private employer-sponsored plans dealing with uh, hospitals and dealing with certain types of physicians, emergency department physicians, anesthesiologists. Those are the specialties where unshoppability is a real concern. When you have all three of these components in place, you have a price problem. You have a price problem. Now, <clears throat> how big is this glitch? How big a deal is um, the glitch? Um, uh, Let's just do some, some round numbers. Private health plans pay hospitals uh, north of half a trillion dollars a year. Uh, and based on the, the pricing and the, and the degree of dispersion that I'm seeing in the pricing, I'm going to you know, roughly estimate 25, 35, 45 percent of those pricing is, is uh, exploitative pricing, taking advantage of the glitch to drive up prices beyond what you would see in a competitive market. If you start multiplying 25, 35, 45 percent of $500 billion, you quickly get into the hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And so this, this is a, a big dollar amount, uh, even relative to U.S. healthcare spending, even relative to the G U.S. GDP. We're talking about um, a sizable financial impact. So let me try to um, take a step back and get to the, um, get to the takeaways. Um, and the, the first one is, um, uh, you know, I've seen some interesting commentary pieces about price transparency and, and the need for it, the role of it. Uh, will, it, will, it uh, will it undermine competitiveness? Will it increase spending? Price transparency, uh, measuring and reporting prices paid by private health plans is by itself isn't going to do much. Um, and, uh, and the quip here is partners shrug. Part, I'm thinking of partners healthcare system in Massachusetts very high price system, you know, we've known that for a long time. I mean, the, the Massachusetts uh, state government's been putting out report after report on hospital pricing. We, we basically know partners as a high price system. What are you going to do about it? That, just knowing the, the outlines of the price problem do, it does not fix it, okay? Um, but I think that putting prices on the table is part of the discussion, uh, and it's part of wrapping our arms around the glitch and figuring out how to address it. So when, when I think about this, this three-legged uh, glitch, you have the bilateral negotiations, uncapped uh, out of network, and um, widespread unshoppability. Which leg of that stool is most amenable to change? In my mind, it's the uncapped out of network liability. And um, there's been a lot of attention on uh, surprise billing uh, in, in this Congress. That, that's nibbling at, the, at this issue, but surprise billing uh, typically, the, the scope of the proposal is to look at um, out-of-network professionals at an in-network facility. That's, that's actually a pretty small dollar issue. Um, the mu much bigger uh, dollar amounts and the much bigger um, 
uh, dollar impact of this glitch is, is on the hospital side. And, uh, and the um, uh, American Hospital Association, other hospital associations have come out very strongly against setting limits on payments for out-of-network care. It's very clear that that, that is, a, is a direct financial risk to their, to their bottom line. That, that signal, their, their uh, opposition signals to me, we're getting close to the, the heart of the pricing problem here. Um, the third takeaway um, is when we talk about this, uh, this pricing glitch uh, uh, between private health plans and hospitals, um, don't expect patients to, to fix this on their own. Um, you, you can give them a, a price shopping tool. Uh, you can um, uh, maybe can have a concierge specialist call them up and try to counsel them. The, the, the level of the dysfunction is between health plans and hospitals and with uh, policymakers uh, intentionally allowing the, the glitch to persist. That, that's the level where the problem exists, and that's the level where it needs to be solved. Um, cranking up deductibles uh, is not going to fix the glitch. Uh, uh, providing more patient-facing price transparency tools is not going to fix the glitch. Um, that, that's, uh, oh, and I'm right at uh, 16 minutes. I'm going to pause there, and I'm very interested to hear uh, questions and feedback from you all. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. I, I noticed on the program that I'm listen, uh, listed as the rapporteur, but um, I'm kind of more a provocateur, which I saw Joanne gets to be. So I wanted to say a few things before throwing this open to discussion. Um, one of them is I love talking to um, uh, health economists and health policy people because we at Kaiser Health News and in my previous life at the New York Times, you hear how all these things are playing out on patients' lives. Um, and uh, often the theory, as it trickles down, falls apart and, and uh, plays out in ways that one never imagined. And to give you a few examples of that, things I'd just like to throw out to set the discussion, because I think in my rapporteur, rapporteur role, um, we've talked a lot. We focused on two areas, which I think are the areas that we're all grappling with now, which is hospitals and pharmaceutical prices. Those are the two big high price issues. Um, so um, a few, th three little stories. Um, we talked about, uh, someone mentioned out-of-network doctors and ERs and anesthesiologists. Um, the stories we're hearing lately are um, from people who go to deliver a baby at a hospital. Uh, the baby is premature. The baby gets taken to the NICU. And the NICU doctors are out-of-network. So um, I, I say this only to, 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 to observe that as clever as um, the policymakers and economists have been, what strikes me again and again is how agile this system is at adapting to find new ways to make money and to find the loopholes in whatever policy is developed. Another kind of data point I want to put out there, because I was a, um, an ER physician in the 1990s when um, HIV AIDS in New York, where I practiced, was a terrible terrible, deadly disease, rapidly fatal. Um, a drug came onto the market when I was working in the ER called AZT. It was the first drug that effectively changed this disease from often a, a literal death sentence within weeks or months to um, the beginning of making it a treatable chronic disease. Um, AZT was priced at that time um, $8,000 a year. So about $650 a month. I mean, that's what people pay for insulin now often. So how did the bar change so much in the last um, 25 years? How did we get to a place, the place that we are today? I often say that our healthcare system today is a, um, you know, a great example of the road to hell is paved in good intentions. So, um, and the last thing I would point out is we talk about consumer choice and um, uh, which a number of people have pointed out the, the weaknesses of that is, um, you know, we hear from patients who say, oh, I went to my directory and um, I called the doctor who said, it says it's in network, but he was in network and not taking patients. And I'm like, Okay, as a patient, that means not in network, right? And you know, when I go on the website to book an airline ticket, 
Delta doesn't tell me, oh, three hundred dollars, but um, that was two weeks ago. So now you have. To. So I think you know we say that patients are not good at shopping around, and I don't think consumer choice is is the answer. But I think hey, if you want patients, people like me, to be consumers, you got to give them actual tools that would allow that, and that includes. Uh, you know, some accurate pricing on lab tests um, uh, uh, presented to me and to the physicians. Um, you know, when my doctor says you need a lab test and he clicks the button to send it to New York Presbyterian Hospital, a lab test that might might have cost me $7 if I went down the street to Quest is going to cost six to 700 So um, we give people real tools. They might be able to use them at the margins, particularly with high deductible plans, but I think consumers are incredibly frustrated that we say be a good consumer, and then you go in, another bill we just heard, you know, you go in, I did everything you said, I got my estimate, they said $1,000, and then the bill was 8000 right? Okay, well, a contractor did that, you would be screaming fraud, but with healthcare, we accept the explanation. So, having said all that, and giving you those scary examples, um, uh, I wanted to ask all the panelists, whoever wants to take this on, um, do you think at any level that we can design a market smart enough to control prices, or are we going to, do we need some kind of price controls? Um, we've tried a lot of different things. People are getting smarter and smarter, but so is the, the, the healthcare market. Um, I'm putting you all on the spot, I realize, because this is a highly controversial question. Since I'm the most ignorant in that particular topic, <laughs> I'll take it. OK, good. <laughs> I'm going to make everyone answer it, so. <laughs> uh, I think rates for populations could be the solution. And there could be a fixed rate between Indiana and Michigan that would solve the problem that, that you're raising, Chap. And I do not think that the fee-for-service model can work, will work, um, and 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 will will uh, um, enable a rationalization of all these funky numbers that we are witnessing. I mean, every other country pretty much has decided, in some form, to do some kind of rate card or rate setting. Um, but I don't know. I don't know where we'll go. David. Right. As it, if you look at. Uh, Public utilities, electric uh, generation and transmission, it, it has strong natural monopoly characteristics, and uh, and we don't let let you know Pepco just run wild and charge whatever uh, whatever rates they want for electricity. Um, it it it's gotten to be you know the uh, electric generation and transmission. It's not a really fun, exciting uh, you know industry, but it it works and it enables the rest of the economy to function. Um, and the, the regulation of prices uh, follows the, the features of that industry and that market. And, and I feel like in, in the healthcare industry, um, uh, on, the, on the Medicare and Medicaid side, we, we're doing price controls. And, and you know, newsflash, they work. They, they constrain spending growth. Uh, MedPAC is fine-tuning the price controls. Uh, well, Med, MedPAC is advising Congress on how to fine-tune the price controls, um, but they're in the fine-tuning mode. Uh, on, the, on the private side, we, we've done a, a massive experiment on letting private health plans and providers negotiate without uh, price controls, and we've seen the result. It's incredibly expensive, and, and it's unsustainably expensive. So short answer, yes. I'm a card-carrying economist. Um, <laughs> My card may be uh, revoked. Uh, I'll just say yes. <laughs> Wait, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can let you get away with it just that. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we've, <laughs> we've tried, uh, you know, market-based methods. And, and from this panel discussion, uh, healthcare, at least as it is currently constructed in, in the U.S., that has this public-private blend uh, and you know, the inability to really, you know, that the, the assumptions one makes in your Econ 1 class about how a market functions, none of them exist in healthcare. So if we rely on the market to determine price, it's not, market is like in those, these quotes. Um, and so, uh, and it's not working. That's what we're trying to do. We're still using our Econ 1 
uh, kind of uh, conclusions without you know the, the first without the page before the, or the slide before that listed all the assumptions on which that conclusion is based um, and and so we have to try something else and, and I'm all for giving uh, price controls a try I think uh, it's a common misconception that uh, we don't already pursue administrative pricing in the pharmaceutical space we do uh, and uh, the federal government is setting prices uh, in a number of different ways. Um, in Part B, uh, for the drugs that are injected and or otherwise infused, um, in the me or in the medical benefit drugs, if you will, we have average sales price that replaced a system of literally charge whatever you want um, that came through um, the better the medical, the sorry, Balanced Budget Act, or the, no, I think Medicare Modernization Act of 2003. Um, and if anything, what we are, what the policymakers are talking about is supercharging that. Um, and uh, through imported prices or some other uh, method of setting prices, um, I would say on the Part B side, we have a variant of that, which is we let the PBMs negotiate on behalf of the federal government. And we use exactly the same negotiating tactics that, and really the same companies that are doing so for the private plans. Uh, so they're doing it for us. Um, we don't have that in Part B, but we're getting there. Um, clearly, part MedPAC has um, come out supporting um, the introduction of some sort of vendor that would act like a PBM on the Part B space. Um, the only place that we don't have real pricing leverage is in places where uh, there's no competition. Um, and there we do have a problem, but even there, um, uh, we could com exercise compulsory licensing if we want. It's already on the books. We don't like to do that because of the innovation incentive that sets, but we don't need new regulations. We already do it, or already have the power to do it if we wanted to. Um, and then I think lastly, um, there is the question of administrative pricing on the level of prices that we're going to pay for these products, and then there's the inflation over time. And um, we already have pricing breaks on inflation in Medicaid. Um, that percolate through the system and have their own implications. Uh, and Congress is considering uh, putting together pricing inflation on Part B and Part D um, that would control launch prices. The administration has come out in support of them, um, as has MedPAC. So we'll see. And how is this going to apply to the, the private insurer market? Because we, we do, as people have noted, you know, uh, control pricing in certain government plans, um, you know, that doesn't help someone uh, with private insurance who is asked to pay, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 for the newest cancer drug. How, how do you see that helping or playing, spilling over into the private insurer world? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Chapin that Keep, there are a lot of Americans who are very underinsured and face first dollar non-coverage, if you will, for drugs. Drugs that they have to take every single day. Um, and uh, there is no cap on what people are being asked to pay, particularly in the high deductible plans. And it is fundamentally eroding access and having, having real issues on people's ability to afford drugs that they need to take keep themselves healthy. Um, I want to open it up to questions. I have plenty more, but I know you all do in the audience. Well, I'm just going to uh, insert our wonderful web audience oh. <laughs> and hope someone can respond to this. John Bo Bogle said structure determines strategy. Maybe we need a different corporate structure, perhaps not nonprofit or for-profit, but a hybrid buyer co-op or an ESOP structure. Any reaction to that? <laughs> Chapin. <Anybody? laughs> 
the the nonprofit okay uh, the hospital industry is dominated by nonprofits yeah. with with some government uh, owned and run facilities and some for profit run facilities. The the fact that the hospital industry is dominated by nonprofits, I think, has has kind of slowed the uh, the the march in the direction of uh, pricing exploitation, uh, and um, and so the the nonprofit status, the the charitable mission, I think, ha is is one of is the the only break on uh, pricing completely unraveling in the in the hospital market. Uh, different ownership structures that. Uh, uh, ESOP uh, uh, blends of nonprofit. I'm I'm not sure, um, but uh, the, the nonprofit status I, I think has 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 slowed um, uh, the price unraveling uh, for hospital services. Prices would be even worse. Prices would be worse if the hospital industry weren't dominated by nonprofits. Can Physician, I ask? Can physicians I Physicians are for profit. Let me point that out. The can NICU I ask the audience and the people profit. on the panel? Do you think that it's that the nonprofit status of hospitals has significantly, um, I, I see in our our databases, some of the nonprofits are charging just as much, if not more, than the for profits at this point in this point in time. I, I don't think the, the the question had more than for profit and non for profit. I think yeah. the question yeah. um, that, that came from the web audience had to do with the structure of. Of delivery, and so is it hospitals versus physician groups versus payors and employers, and the challenge is, are, are these uh, constructs the right ones, or is the dynamic between these constructs enough to advance healthcare in this country? And the answer is clearly no. I totally agree that the idea of hospitals and physicians and, and payors, this triangle uh, trying to serve employers is not working. And I do fundamentally believe that, that there, should, there are significant opportunities in the co-op models or in different kinds of partnerships between um, uh, hospitals, providers, and, and uh, uh, health plans. Okay. Uh, let's start there and work our way across all the way to... Uh, And can you identify yourself as you, as you ask a question? Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Bob Murray. I was a former executive director of the Maryland Hospital uh, Rate Setting uh, Agency. Uh, now had, that I've introduced myself, I've revealed the bias to the question that I'm about to ask. <laughs> That's why um, I ask everyone to introduce me. <laughs> um, given, well, my bias is that the healthcare market is screwed up. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> this, is a, this is something I think other countries have recognized. Um, my bias is also that administered pricing systems like Medicare and Medicaid have worked very well. You have evidence from various states that uh, have had some success in containing costs. The rest of the world has figured this out, and virtually every developed country has some type of a, a government-administered pricing system. If that's the, the conclusion that we ulti ultimately get to, where do we start? And I direct the question to Chapin. There's a range, when you talk about government administered pricing systems, there's a range of options from setting limits uh, to doing benchmarks, which number of states are looking to do, to benchmark Medicare uh, payments, uh, North Carolina, I believe Montana, uh, Oregon just passed legislation. Or, um, because a lot of people equate rate regulation with pornography, how about hardcore rate setting like <laughs> Maryland, <laughs> what, what, where does one start in that spectrum of options for government uh, administered limits or price setting? Right, so you, you definitely don't start by paying hospitals 100% of Medicare rates for their privately insured. That, that would be financially disastrous for the hospital industry and for the patients they serve. Um, I, I think my, my sense is you, you start Roughly where we are, but you put uh, the price trends on a on a lower trajectory, and and the more extreme the prices are, uh, the more plausible it is that the price trajectory could be flat or declining in nominal dollars. Um, uh, so it depends. I mean, I was just um, on an email exchange with some folks in Indiana who are who are trying to come up with it, with an actionable strategy to address their hospital prices and. and and the notion that that um, 
that these folks were spelling out that made sense to me was start by uh, demanding that the health plan uh, pay hospitals a percent of Medicare rather than off discounted charges or some secret formula that is uh, uh, you know based on their legacy system. Start by paying a percent of Medicare. Set an upper limit at uh, no hospital can be paid more than 300 percent of Medicare, uh, and then start uh, start narrowing the the variation and pushing the trajectory mm -hmm. down. Um, that would be the the case in Indiana. Uh, in in Michigan, it, it would be it would be a terrible plan to start paying 300 percent of Medicare to any hospital because <laughs> they're they're you know you want to keep them you know more or less where where they are. So. It, it's very location specific, and, and th this ties into the Medicare for all, and, and how much uh, should a Medicare for all program pay? We, we've we've um, allowed this tremendous drift in private negotiated prices uh, to manifest itself, and now we have uh, a huge natural variability across hospitals, states, uh, metro areas, and. Um, if, you, if you're starting to contemplate a Medicare for all, it cannot be 150% of Medicare in a, for every facility in every state off the bat. Some places would get a huge windfall, other places would be ruined. Uh, so, but I'll also say the Medicare prospective payment system in 1982, 83, they started with tremendous variation in costs across hospitals. They gradually brought them together. Uh, and it, I, th I think it was maybe a five, 10 year uh, phase in. That, that's the kind of uh, phase in that, that would have to be contemplated. Yeah. I'll just add, you know, I think we've learned from other things we've tried that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to experiment um, and test and uh, hopefully, and, and I don't know if this is possible, but if it's, you know, a, you know the government function is the, the rate regulation, it needs to be nimble. Um, and, and, and react and change as, as we learn what works and what doesn't. And as soon as something works, there's going to be a way to figure out how to get around it. So, um, you know, I think we need to, I, I like the idea of the benchmarking and, and I think tied to what uh, Mike Chernu said earlier, uh, if we put more risk on the, on the providers, they are, they're more involved than I think the rate setters, um, but we just lower the benchmarks. So that's something that I think is worth trying and testing. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind as we move towards a more controlled system that, it, that we have to find a way to make it nimble. I have uh, one thing to add here, which is um, that at the end of the day, we still have to subsidize unprofitable services and services that are absolutely critical to public health. And um, even as we were kind of thinking through how to cap, um, and actually had an inflation set as well, we still have to subsidize the safety net. And um, one thing that, that um, I've been thinking a lot about is that uh, there is some revenue generation that the hospitals are making off of drugs that is supposed to be going towards subsidizing the safety net, yet those institutions actually can pick and choose what they call the safety net. Um, and they don't actually have to keep inpatient psych beds open or keep an emergency room open or keep maternity services open. And that just seems like a place, this seems like a place where, yes, we can agree to subsidi subsidization um, at the same time as we get prices in order and maybe we need to kind of wrap our heads around, okay, what does a functioning safety net look like now and who is going to pay for it? I wanted, I think we have time for one more question over here. Something's been waiting. Thanks. I look at the Washington market and the big city markets and what I, oh, my name's Dina Puskin. I'm right now, I'm with AccuHealth, but I, uh, before I retired from the federal government, I was there with, for 32 years implementing different programs and watching as we try to reach out to the most vulnerable population. That being said, I'm looking at our big city markets and I'm seeing, at least in the area of primary care and some specialties, physicians are basically saying, we're not taking insurance. We're moving out of the system of any regulatory. So while we can control perhaps hospitals more easily, the issue really is if that is a 
moves beyond to our specialists. Our specialists tend to often take insurance. But if it moves beyond because rate setting appears to be too onerous, mm -hmm. and there's enough of a market that will pay for non-participation or whatever, and we allow, and we allow that, then we are, will increase the, inequ uh, the inequitable um, distributions. That being said, then what do you do as you try to move to rate setting across the board and not look at the unintended consequences? Any thoughts? So this actually ties back to Congresswoman Dingell's uh, example of child psychiatry and, and um, uh, families having uh, a, a real struggle in, in uh, finding a child psychiatrist uh, who's, who participates in their, in their plan network. Uh, and, um, and I mean, the, the, the issue there is that the, there's, there's such a constrained supply that um, child psychiatrists can do much, much better financially just by refusing all uh, insurance and just treating uh, generally you know, middle-income or well-off patients uh, uh, for, for cash. Um, and, and that, um, I'm not sure if, that, if that's, partly that's the result of uh, uh, prices for child psychiatry services being set relatively low by uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and then the private plans uh, piggyback on that. But, uh, but I think that's more of a, uh, a supply problem and that, um, uh, and that um, you know, Mike Chernow was talking about the, the, the wisdom of rebalancing uh, reimbursement rates to try to bring more professionals into, into um, specialties where, where there's a real supply problem and, and, um, and child psychiatry uh, is one of them. So I'm not, right, rate regulation by itself, I don't think necessarily um, drives inequity, but, uh, but it, it, the relative rates can be used to try to steer more professionals into the, yeah. yeah. I'll just say very quickly, you know, I, I think that's a really great point. I, we currently have a system that I think is built for those that uh, have a lot of resources. And we have, we, we make things up for everybody else. We just, you know, there's not money around and, and, it, and it doesn't serve the majority of the U.S. very well. But those that have money, it serves that population. And what you're bringing up is that if we build a system that is aimed to serve a broader segment of the population, that some may peel off. Uh, and, and go on their own for those that have the means. That might be a trade-off worth making, even though it, it has its own problems. I mean, and classically, when I practiced, I, I, I was an, an ER doctor, but I was part of the hospital. I was paid by the hospital. And I think, you know, what we've seen is this disaggregation of medical care, which creates many of these problems. I think we're, we're out of time, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thanks.